Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. I promise we have a ton to talk about, but there's some things that that I, I want to get to that I think are important in a strange kind of way. And I'm going to try to weave it in such a way that you understand the importance and why I've decided to cover it. But there was a woman who wrote an article about powerful women and their, how to deal with Weinstein. And it was published in the Atlantic and her name is Britt Marling. And she explains her history with Harvey Weinstein. And there were so many things that came out of this that I said, I got to cover this. So here's what she says. When the Harvey Weinstein story broke, I thought of something my mother told me when I was a little girl. She said, to be a free woman, you have to be financially independent. She wasn't wrong. And it's funny because I've had that. I'm I'm not reading it anymore. I had that same discussion with my sisters. I've had that same discussion with uh, friends of mine who are on the dating scene. I say to them all the time, I go, look, (laughs) you're wasting your time dating if you're like get a divorce you're struggling and then you meet some guy and he buys you dinner and he, you know, gets a kid some diapers or something here and there. And you think, Oh, my God, he's going to save my life. He's, he's amazing. And he's not, you're, you're in a mode of going, I just lost my livelihood. And this guy looks like Prince charming because he's bought me dinner a couple of times, filled my car with gas, you know, pay, he, he's, you know, chump changing you. And so you think, Oh, he's my savior. And then you, you, you know, marry the guy or start dating the guy and you find out he's an ogre. So you got to wait until you're there. That's when you want to offer yourself up to somebody is when you're at your best, not when you're broken. And so I've told my sisters this and many other female friends and what have you. And I go, look, and by the way, this is true of guys too. If you're down on your luck and, and some girl comes along, she's like, look, I got it. You know, I'll pick up the check. Okay, fine. I'm not telling you, you know, everybody doesn't need a little help, but you can't make your decisions based on that. Guys tend not to. We tend to be like, nah, you know, we have a different mindset and I'll leave it at that. We can talk about it in another show, but that's the the difference. Women will see this guy's Prince Charming. Guys will see it as like, all right, well, I'll hang around, you know, (laughs) take advantage of it for a bit until I find Miss Wright or whatever. But women are like, no, you're it. Oh my gosh. So anyway, she says, I studied economics in college and went to New York to become an investment banker. To be blunt, I wanted the freedom money can buy. I had a sudden change of heart while working at Goldman Sachs as a summer analyst. I decided that if the world required me to sell the hours of my life in exchange for access to what had long ago been free, food, water, shelter, I wanted to at least be doing something that stirred my soul. This is granted a privileged position. But as a young woman, this was the conclusion I came to. Before I get to the conclusion, I want to tell you she gave us a hint as to her ideology because she says that, you know, food, water and shelter were free. Yeah, maybe years ago, if you want to be in a cave and food, water and shelter can be free right now. If you want to drink nasty water, it can be free right now. But I digress. So she says, I had discovered acting and filmmaking in college. And the more time I spent immersed in it, the more I liked the person I became. I listened more acutely. I was more emphatic and imaginative. These are qualities that seem to to be culturally on the decline. Our culture lacks forward thinking talkers who can turn a profit without feeling uh, too much about who may suffer the consequences. Usually poor people, people of color and women acting felt like a noble pursuit and maybe even a small act of resistance. I don't know if that's how actors feel, but I will tell you this. What she said about opening your imagination and things like that, I completely agree. I think everybody should pursue an art in some form or another, music or drawing or whatever. Anyway, she says, Hollywood was, of course, a rude awakening to the kind of idealism. I quickly realized that a large portion of the town functioned inside a soft and sometimes literal trafficking or prostitution of young women, a commodity with an endless supply and an endless demand. The storytellers, the people with economic and artistic power are, by and large, straight white men. 
As of 2017, women make up only 23% of the Directors Guild of America, and only 11% are people of color. White men tend to tell stories from their perspective, as one naturally does, which means women are genuinely underwritten, generally underwritten. They don't necessarily even need names. Bikini Babe 2, Blonde 4 are parts I audition for. If the female characters are lucky enough to have names, they are usually designed only to ask the questions that prompt the lead male monologue, or they're quickly killed in service to the to advancing the plot. Now I want to stop there for a second and say, she's explaining Hollywood, telling you the inside scoop. It's a male, white male dominated society. Remember when Michelle Obama pointed across the aisle and talked about the white men over there? She's pointing to the very same men, but the problem is these men aren't conservatives these men aren't right you know right wingers who are keeping their thumb on you know their their boot on the neck of the of the females in america no these are white men who are keeping their feet and and other body parts on the various pe- portions of the bodies of america of Amer- of american women and being blamed acting as if these people are the conservatives it's not us so she's telling you straight up there's not enough blacks, there's not enough women, which for the record, I don't care. I don't care who makes films. If a film is good, I'll watch it. I don't care who makes it. Does a perspective matter? Of course it does. I'd love to see more good films from a black perspective, but it isn't like somebody's stopping us. If I wanted to, I could make them. Anyway, here's what she says. Once when I was standing in line for some open call audition for a horror film, I remember catching my reflection in the mirror and realizing I was dressed like a sex object. Every woman in line for the audition for nurse was, it seemed, was it seemed, it was for nurse. Uh, she says, we had all internalized on some level the idea that if we were going to be cast, we'd better sell what was desired. Not our artistry, not our imaginations, but our bodies. It was around this time that I remember sitting in a casual gathering where a straight white male activist said, Our gender and race has all the power. So when you want to have sex with a woman, you have to ask and get her verbal consent, he continued. If that woman is a person of color, she is oppressed by both her gender and her race, then you should really ask twice. The literalism of his ratio was ridiculously reductive and his declarative tone off-putting, but I appreciated that he was trying to articulate how complicated it is to negotiate the invisible forces of privilege and power inside sexual encounters. He was trying to help other young men understand why it can sometimes be hard for any woman to find and voice no within a culture that has taught her to mistrust herself or to value herself through male approval. That is the biggest bunch of hogwash that I've ever heard. If you treat, if you train your children, boys to respect women and women, girls, young girls to respect themselves, that is nonsense. Everything she just said. But what's funny about it is how it came to be, and she's listening to a male activist who's talking about this stuff, and none of them know anything about it. They've, they've been in this liberal bubble that makes them think that they're intellectuals understanding the, the human psyche as it relates to sex and, and other human interactions, and it's nonsense. She says, I emerged from this period thinking about the power dynamics inside Hollywood. If auditioning for parts was largely about seeking male approval, and the stories themselves were narratives I didn't always politically or morally agree with, then the only way for me to navigate Hollywood with more, uh, with more agency was to become a storyteller myself. That's an easy thing to say and very hard to do. I stopped auditioning. I worked a day job, spent nights and weekends at the public library downtown reading screenwriting books. I did this for years. Eventually, I co-wrote and starred in two films, and was very fortunate when they were programmed at Sundance in 2011. So, stop there. This young lady, she's obviously bright, going to work for Goldman Sachs, says, I took some time off, wanted to learn acting, found out that acting was very male-dominated, not by us, not by conservative men, by leftist men who still treat women as objects and yada, 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 and you've heard me talk about Holly Weird. 
in the fact that they can say you're too fat, you're too ugly, you're too white, you're too black, and tell you how to be. So she didn't like that, and she says, you know, I felt objectified. So what did I do? I went and decided I was going to become a storyteller. I, she analyzed it the way a management consultant will, like a Goldman Sachs type, and she said, here's what I need to do, and she took it, and she became successful, and in 2011, she got two films green-lighted at Sundance, and bada-bing, bada-boom, life is good. And she says, I'm taking you through this brief history because I think it's important to understanding when Harvey Weinstein requested a meeting with me in 2014, when the industry had deemed I was legitimate fresh meat. And I was in some ways in a slightly different position from many who had walked the gauntlet before me. I too went to the meeting thinking that my entire life was about to change for the better. And I want to come back and make a point about this that I think you're going to find intriguing. Kevin Jackson on the Black Sphere Radio Network. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177 or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com.